moving to uh, basically, we're going to talk about the value of, of no-till and increasing water use efficiency, and I'm going to tell you why that's important to me and to you as we go along. And in all of this, quicker. Um, Give you a little bit of my background uh, and everything, and there's a couple different pieces on here. You can have my uh, office number and my email address if you want that uh, as well. Uh, my background is actually agricultural meteorology and statistics. Uh, I've spent the last 40 years working on water use efficiency in the state of Texas, uh, in the state of Colorado, and the last 25 years in Iowa. Uh, and in, in reality, uh, as we think about water use efficiency, there's a number of different things that, that we have to begin to understand in the overall process of this. And I'm going to weave that story for you today uh, on how all of this fits together <coughs> and how it really begins to be important. But as the beginning of the, a little bit of a preamble on that, the actual beginnings of water use efficiency and the whole concept of that began in the state of Colorado. Uh, and some work that was done clear back just at the turn of the century, uh, in the early 1900s, uh, last century in fact, at the turn of the 19, uh, early 1900s, I'm looking at there's a relationship between water use and, and crop productivity uh, and all of this. So a number of different things happen from, from that standpoint. Why this becomes important is this aspect of the problem. Um, and if you think about the, the problem from the standpoint that if we're going to feed the, the, the world in the future and where we're at today is this solid line across there and, and that's kind of where our projections of grain production are. But in reality, it is much closer to that blue line. Uh, is that we're going to have to move away from where we're at uh, in our trajectory to much more food that we're being produced and what that really translates into is a water deficit. It translates into a water deficit because there's a relationship that we'll talk a lot about today, and that's the relationship between water use and yield. And so, in order to reduce that much, that higher amount of crop, it's going to require more water. Now, when you think about that, there's only so much fresh water on the globe. Uh, we recycle it all through precipitation and snow and, and all these other things that go on. And so what it really points back to the fact is agriculture is going to have to become much more efficient in how we utilize our water. How do we capture that water and put it back in the plant in order to grow that yield that's out there. Uh, and it won't all come from genetics. Okay, sir. No matter what we do, it's not all going to come from new hybrids, new varieties, and things like that. We're going to have to have a much more complex understanding of that system than what we have today. So there's, there's kind of a statement of the problem and why that's important. Just to, to really lay everything out uh, from the standpoint of on, on no-till, uh, there's short-term benefits and there's long-term benefits. And all of these impact uh, water use rates by the crop. Uh, all of them have a particular role to play. In the short term, we'll talk about the reduction of soil water evaporation uh, because of the layer of residue out there. Uh, we'll also, in the short term, talk about the increase of infiltration of rainfall irrigation events uh, because we protect that surface and allow that infiltration rate to continue. We reduce the overall rate of evapotranspiration if we grow those plants in standing stubble. Uh, and we've seen this uh, as well. In the long term, in terms of no-till, we increase the soil water holding capacity because we improve organic matter content and from global listening to Jill uh, a little bit ago. She's talking about all those different things that we do in soil health. One of the pieces that we talk about in soil health, that improving organic matter, is really an improvement of the water holding capacity of that soil. And so we can store a lot more water uh, over time. And we can increase the water availability of that crop because we improve rooting depth, we improve a number of different things along with that. 
Uh, and so when we increase the rooting depth, we extract more nutrients, all these other things that, that lead to this overall change that, that go on. So short term, long term. Put a time frame on this in short term, we can see these effects right during the growing season. Uh, these are not two or three years. These are things that occur right in growing season. Long term is more net three to five uh, year plus uh, change that occur out there. And in reality, I want to come back and, and begin to have you think about it from this perspective and, and the concept of efficiency, uh, the way we think about it relative to agriculture. Uh, and across the, the bottom axis of the x-axis, we talk about inputs of nutrients, uh, inputs of water, inputs of light. Uh, and in fact, you know, we should actually look at, at all those different factors and how they influence plant growth and development yield. And then along the y-axis is basically the yield, whether we talk about grain, whether we talk about biomass, all of these different aspects. And then what we've seen over time is that there's a linear relationship between these inputs and what we see as productivity uh, coming out the other side. Now we can move this curve up and down uh, by slight changes by management. Uh, even in water use efficiency, <coughs> we can move it up by having nitrogen as part of the system. Uh, and obviously we can move it back and forth by changing our inputs uh, as well. And so our goal is really to figure out how do we increase that water use efficiency, uh, how do we maximize our overall aspects of this system that's out there. And we've done this with, with water, we've done it with nutrients, and we've done it with light uh, as different factors. And, and in reality, when you start looking at an agricultural system, what we see as productivity is really a pretty complex system. It is a result of how we optimize water, how we optimize our nutrients, and how we optimize our lighting. And all those things are occurring simultaneously uh, out there. And so what I can tell producers is that farming is not rocket science. Farming is much more complex. Uh, and and, and here's, here's what you got to do in the rocket science. All you need to understand in rocket science is how much payload you have, force of gravity, and you can compute the flight to get that rocket off the ground. That's really all rocket science is. If you think about what you have to do in farming, is that you're optimizing lots of different things, and it's like optimizing six or seven simultaneous differential equations. And most people get scared at one simultaneous differential equation. Two drives most people crazy, but in farming what you're really doing is optimizing six or seven differential equations simultaneously and looking at a response surface up. And so you've got water, you've got nutrients, you've got genetics, you've got all these different things that you're trying to optimize the performance on. And so it's really become very fascinating to me over the past few years of how we can begin to manipulate this system in ways that we haven't done before. <clears throat> now, water use efficiency is not a major concept when you get east of the Missouri River. Okay? <laughs> I can tell you I come from a state of Iowa in which water use efficiency is not the major thing that we look at in terms of product production because our biggest problem is too much water in the spring, we talk about drainage, we talk about all of this, but in reality when we look at the system, we find that in a lot of cases we fall short in our production because we haven't thought about water use efficiency. You move less the Missouri River, as rainfall begins to drop, water use efficiency becomes the primary factor that we need to start thinking about. And so, when it's really how much crop can we grow for the unit amount of water that's out there. And how do we begin to think about managing that overall system? I'm going to just walk you through that story uh, here this morning. Because really what it represents is the amount of water you produce per unit of water transpired by the crop. Uh, and if we want to increase water use efficiency, uh, we really depends on the ability of the crop to use more growth or use less water per unit. So we either want a big home to plant uh, with a small amount of water, or we want to figure out how to make that plant use less water during the growth and not change its productivity. And 
Unfortunately, over time, that slope of that curve hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, we keep adding data to it, but in terms of corn, some of the wheat, uh, those, those lines remain fairly constant in terms of what we have. So it's remained relatively constant in modern agriculture. Uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see that more and more drought tolerant corn that we see out there is that really going to change water use efficiency uh, in that. So far, we haven't seen that in the overall process. And so if the slope is constant or consistent, then the best approach is start to manage the soil water balance. Don't worry about what the crop is doing, but change the amount of water that's available to that crop. And that's where no-till and soil management really come into this overall practice. Because the other thing that I've just observed over the last few years is that we have really divorced soil management from agronomic management. Now that sounds like an indictment uh, against modern agriculture, but what I've observed is that we tend to think about agronomic inputs. We change fertilizer, we change nutrients, I mean, we change hybrids, we talk about all these other inputs on the agronomic side, but we haven't spent enough time thinking about the soil management side in terms of what do we do to really improve that soil in terms of all those other pieces. This effort in terms of soil health today um, is not only focused on what that soil does from the standpoint of biological activity and organic matter, but the overall piece of that should really be thinking about what it does for the water balance. And so that becomes a very interesting piece uh, of this overall puzzle. Because if we want to think about this, just to give a little lesson in what happens here, is that if we think about the amount of water that's used by the crop, and it really represents a, a number of different things that happen uh, all simultaneously. How much water is used by a crop, both from soil water evaporation and plant transpiration, is a function of how much energy goes into that system. And on a bright sunny day, we've got lots of solar radiation in the air, we can transpire lots of water back out. The other factor that influences that is our water vapor gradient, how fast that water moves from the surface into the atmosphere. Uh, moves a lot faster under dry climates than under humid climates, uh, so that's one of the big factors that's out there. Windy days transpire a lot more water than, than in calm days, uh, so it's all driven by how much wind speed is out there. And so the windier it is, the faster all of this exchange uh, occurs out there. And then the final factor that's out there is soil water availability. And in reality, these three factors determine the potential rate of evaporation from that overall surface. That last one determines the actual rate. When you think about it this way, this is the potential size of your checkbook. This one over here is the actual size of your checkbook. <laughs> you know, we all have ideas of a much bigger checkbook than we do in reality, right? I have yet to meet anybody whose actual size of their checkbook meets their potential, right? Or their desire for their potential. And so the same thing in terms of evaporation that's going on out here is that we have all this potential evaporation that the atmosphere demands, and as we move farther and farther west across the United States up through the Rockies, is that our potential ET continues to increase. Because you get low humidities, higher wind speed, high net radiation values, a lot of energy going into that. But soil water availability becomes a major limitation in terms of actually rivers. <clears throat> so a lot of cases we can have values on a given day of 10 to 12 millimeters of water which is about a half inch, but in actuality only use about two tenths or two to three millimeters because soil water places limitations. So in reality, that's why we go back and start focusing on how do we think about changing this reservoir uh, in terms of the soil, what's that mean for us in terms of, of what really happens in terms of the process. So we can think about this from a standpoint of, of limitations, and that is we can either increase the ability of the plant to extract more water from the profile, profile, so we can increase transpiration from that. The bigger the root system, the more we can do that. We can decrease the soil water loss through evaporation. We can reduce the E out of ET, 
which is uh, an interesting piece. Or we can increase the capacity to hold more water. Or we could just change the whole cropping system. We change the whole cropping system entirely uh, in terms of what we do. Uh, and think about the different rotations that we have, a uh, number of different things that go on. The reason that this one goes last is because it's often what the last, last anybody wants to think about. Tell me how to do all the rest of the things, but don't tell me I've got to change my properties. <coughs> uh, and, and so these are things that, as we look at this overall puzzle, and it's really what it is, is a puzzle of how do we think about managing this, these become the pieces uh, that we can manipulate. Just a, a little bit of reality uh, for you if you take that same curve, and this actually happens to be actual data uh, that we work this is warm water use efficiency. This lower line is about where we're at in the state uh, average yields across Iowa. And our water used to produce that is about 550 millimeters of water, a little over 20 inches. Everybody wants to grow 300 bushel corn. Uh, you know, that's kind of the magic number that everybody has as a plateau out there. But in reality, to grow 300 bushel corn uh, in, in our current rate in which we do everything is going to take five more inches of water transpired to that crop. Where we're at today, the 300 bushels is not coming free. Just thought I'd shock you with that, okay? You're not going to grow that without investing the first thing, more water into it. You're growing that without investing more nitrogen, by the way, we manage it, but I'd not be able to grow that without investing more water into it. So, in order for that to occur, it says we're going to have to have five more inches of water available during that growing season. Uh, how do we put it there? Uh, and water becomes a limitation of all of this. It really says that we got to rethink how we're managing that E component out of ET. How do we manage the whole reservoir? How do we manage the runoff? <coughs> all these other pieces of the puzzle. And this is where no-till really begins to fit into the overall system. Uh, in thinking about this. Um, in the soil water balance, uh, in terms of, again, think about the soil water balance is basically your checkbook uh, that's in the uh, water uh, within the system. What we've got on uh, any given day in terms of the soil water that's within the soil profile is a function of how much precipitation has occurred, uh, whether you've added any irrigation, and then how much you've lost in terms of evaporation after transpiration is going off the drain. And so, if you think about this as, again, a checkbook, income, spending. It's really what it is uh, going off. And what we see in a lot of cases is that runoff and drainage uh, are often big losses particularly in a lot of our soils as we begin to, to look at this. And this actually occurs as we go farther and farther east, as we move now from west of Missouri River through Iowa, through the, through the Corn Belt, runoff becomes a major problem uh, because we are losing water on that. And drainage becomes a major problem. We actually worry more about draining our soils than we do how much water we store in that profile. And we're seeing a rapid increase in drainage uh, across all the corn belt uh, for a number of different reasons. <clears throat> so here's just an example: is, is let's alter the water balance, and reducing E out of ET uh, is one component of conservation tillage. Uh, as we begin to add residue onto that, one of the things we see is that we do reduce the E out of out of ET, uh, and just different examples uh, along the way. Here's what happens uh, in all of this and the mechanism by which it occurs is that that residue layer is going to reduce the evaporation component by 50-80% compared to the tilled soil. It's a fairly large amount uh, in there. Uh, and what happens when you have a standing stubble layer uh, out there is that you really create a microclimate near the surface that's less conducive to evaporation. And here's what happens when you have that standing stubble uh, out there is that the 
The wind speed rapidly decreases. That's one of the factors that drives the evaporation rate. Uh, so it's very, very calm down in there. But the other thing that occurs is that the humidity rapidly increases. And so what you see is that you've altered two of the major components. You modified the wind speed in terms of the rate of trans uh, transport of water away, and you've changed the gradient in terms of now having something that is less conducive to the rate of water vapor exchange. And so what we see with that standing stubble out there is that evaporation is greatly reduced in all these different things because it's an entirely different microclimate. Uh, I'll give you uh, an example out of, of West Texas uh, because one of the things that I worked on in, in West Texas was actually growing cotton in the standing wheat stubble. Uh, one of the things that we discovered was that uh, water use efficiency uh, basically was increased by 30% with that cotton in that standing wheat stubble. Uh, and we had larger leaves, more rapid growth because the plants were, uh, cotton plants were shouldered in the wind. Uh, anybody knows anything about West Texas and around Lubbock is that the wind does blow a lot. Uh, and it continues to blow and these four plants are subjected to this constant wind and, and it moves a lot of water vapor away. Uh, but when you put them inside of that standing stubble out there, is the leaf sizes went from being outside to being almost three times larger. Uh, when they were in the stubble. Because again, they were sheltered away from the wind, uh, water use efficiency increased, uh, and then had early flowering because of reduced stress. If you're not beat around by this wind all the time, uh, you have an entirely physiological reaction uh, in terms of growth. And so what we saw was that basically we could change the evaporation component just by having this sheltered effect uh, that's out there. And so when you then reduce that down to a stubble layer that's only about this thick, you still see the same effect of evaporation, but you don't see the effect on the plant that's growing in that, but you do see the effect on the soil. Uh, and, and again, that layer that's out there uh, is very, very important. The other thing that we've seen when we add that residue layer in terms of evaporation component is that it makes much more Advantageous, advantageous use of light rainfalls because, because we do take that, that rain uh, that occurs in light rain events, it moves down through that stubble and wets the surface, and the roots of the crop that are growing in that stubble tend to be right near the surface. In a dry area where they dry down out, it's, we really have to wet that soil down almost six inches before it finds a root. Uh, that take it up. So we see an entirely different rooting pattern, we see a different water uptake, we see an entirely different advantage of, of, uh, of light rainstorms uh, that occur uh, from this standpoint. So all of these things occur as part of this process. But if you go back and you think about this, this whole evaporation aspect uh, in terms of ET, uh, in terms of evaporation as well as transpiration, is that there's differences among crops and there's differences among soils. Uh, there's variations within a field and there's variations among years. So it's hard to give you the exact number to say this is the ET amount for given crop. Because go back to think about the components that I that I showed you that drove that process. <coughs> ET is driven by energy, it's driven by humidity levels, wind speed, all of these other things that change from year to year. The soil water component, that last box out there, is why we see variations in all the fields. Uh, because there's different water holding capacity, uh, there's different crop growth rates, a number of different things that go on. And we've actually uh, done studies. Uh, this is a study that we did across the central Iowa. We had uh, 14 different fields uh, that we instrumented. Uh, 14 different farmer fields, they weren't plots, they were actually in the center of large fields. I think the smallest field was 160 acres, most of them were, were half section size fields. They all had equipment in it that allows us to measure the CO2 the water vapor released by that crop on a continuous basis. So what you see across here uh, 
And this is just the evaporation component going on, and you can see the difference between corn and soybeans, and those lines across the top are just the variation among fields. Tremendous difference among fields that were out there, and it wasn't due to the fact that we changed the overall climate that we were in, but we changed the soil water availability because of different soils that we measured as part of the process. Uh, and then you get the crop difference uh, as well. Here's another example. This is just differences uh, within a given field. Uh, the, just to put a context in for you, uh, the clarion soils are a, uh, the top of the, the hills that we have out there. Uh, they're about a one and a half to two percent organic matter soil. Uh, Webster soil uh, is down near the bottom of the toe slope. Uh, it's much more in that five to six percent organic matter differences. Um, what we show you, and, and we've got year after year of data that shows this, that they, the lighter soils have less water use throughout the whole growing season, uh, and the Webster soils have a greater water use. And in fact, there's a difference is about twofold. And if you go back and remember that curve that I showed you, that our average yield in Iowa in terms of water use is somewhere in that 500 millimeter uh, per year, uh, and we're getting about 200 bushels out of that, but that clarion soil is about 300, and the yields that are coming out of that are about that 150 to 160 bushel uh, in there. We just don't have the water in those soils to, to produce that crop. What that also means is that you can end up with large yield differences across fields. Uh, and we often see yield differences in central Iowa that go from 200 plus to less than 100 plus within the same field. It's not unusual to have 250 to less than 100 within the same field, almost a two and a half time. And it's all due to soil water level, uh, and that's really the driving factor because of it. it all rains the same across the field. A number of different things that are going on from that standpoint, so soil water level. Uh, and so when you think about managing that, uh, the E component becomes part of this overall puzzle because our evaporation component out of these soils is on the order of, and this is all transpiration. Uh, these are all back calculated to get the transpiration rates. The evaporation component out of these soils is about three to 400 millimeters. So almost as much evaporation as we get transpiration through the year because they're so wet in the spring uh, when we have uh, very little crop. Here's the other piece uh, that, that is out here uh, that we use all the time. Uh, this is some data from Don Murkowski. We have other uh, data from our own that shows this. Uh, how much we disturb the soil, whether we don't disturb it, low disturbance and high disturbance. Uh, the blue line is the, uh, the evaporation <coughs> out of that soil over a 24-hour period. Uh, you see, the more we disturb that soil, the faster the evaporation rate. And the rule of thumb that we use, and we've discovered, is that every tillage pass in the spring is a half inch of water evaporated into the atmosphere. That's how much that soil is dried very quickly. So two passes is an inch of water. And so really has an impact. And actually, let me, I have to tell you how we discovered this. We didn't set out to, to design a study that says how much water is being evaporated by tillage out there. Uh, is it all those instruments that, that are in that previous graph that had the red and blue lines on it are basically in the field year on a year round basis. Uh, and so they're measuring all these different components of evaporation and CO2 uptake by the system. But what we would see in the spring is that we'd start seeing these high evaporation rates occur. And we didn't have any rainfall, nothing else. But what we went back and started looking at was Every time we had these high evaporation rates, the guys were out tilling. And so we, we would go then and monitor when they tilled that, and then we'd look at the data coming in. And what we discovered is that for the 24 hours after they tilled, there's about a half inch of water uh, in there. And so you're losing a lot of water. And where are you losing it from? The seed zone. So in dry years, what you're doing is putting your whole crop establishment at risk uh, in terms of that. If you get into areas of, of central Iowa and, and east, that's 
people say, well, that's really not a problem because we have excess water anyway. Uh, but again, the farther west you go, uh, crop establishment becomes a risky factor uh, in all of this. So that's why this becomes an overall piece of this. If you look at this continuum uh, of disturbances, and, and we use this as an example in terms of, of uh, looking at uh, how we look at evaporation components, how we look at all this, because the other piece that you're losing by this very major disturbance is all the carbon that's stored in the soil during the growing season gets put back into the atmosphere as well. And organic matter is built because of carbon return to the soil. Now let me tell you how dramatic that is. Because we also monitor the same thing we monitor in, in uh, uh, water vapor going out, we also monitor in terms of CO2. And what we see in the fall after, till, or after harvest is complete is that the CO2 levels settle down about 385, 390, somewhere in that range. And then when everybody starts tilling, the atmospheric concentration across central Iowa increases to about 450 to 480 parts per minute. So all of that CO2 that we store it all summer long into the root system and into the soil is put back into the atmosphere by all the tillage that we do. And so if we put it back to the atmosphere, I can tell you it's not going into organic matter. It's because we put it back into the old recycling process. Uh, and so all these different things that are, that are happening. So it becomes a rather dramatic uh, process in terms of what's going on. So we know that, that tillage increases the soil water evaporation rate. Uh, we know that those differences among, within a field are really due to the organic matter content and soil water holding capacity. Uh, and we use this relationship. This is organic matter and this is available water content. Uh, the more organic matter, the higher the water uh, holding content of that soil. And so the longer we can continue to grow, organic matter within that soil, the more water we can store within that bank uh, that we call our soil. So we know that organic matter is there. You think about that aspect and you think about reducing the evaporation component by keeping that residue out there is that we make more water available. Because this just happens to be one graph of a field. Uh, the red uh, are the high, the red and the purples are the high yields, the greens are the low yields across that. Uh, field, and you can see that those go all the way from uh, about 200 plus to uh, less than 120 uh, across that field. This is not a atypical field. It's a typical field that we see all this variation in uh, across that. And what it's done, what it is, is related to water volume capacity. Because the greatest water use time of a crop is during grain filling. So it takes little water to grow that crop to flowering point. It takes most of the water to grow that crop from flowering to maturity. And so if we limit the water availability at that time, then we have reduction in productivity. And so what we end up with is low water use efficiency uh, because we've invested water into that crop and we see no grain coming back. And we, that's what we really see across this field here. Uh, and so these water use patterns basically causes a drought stress to occur in the year. Uh, and so all of these different things uh, that happen to us we need to understand. So in conservation agriculture, in terms of no-till and all the other pieces, is that we think about just reducing the tillage practices, so we reduce the evaporation component from that standpoint. Uh, so we reduce the cross-sectional area of tillage uh, in all of this, so we're, we're not taking CO2 back to the atmosphere, we're not evaporating water back to the atmosphere, we're maintaining that surface residue, so we change the E component uh, in all of this. Uh, because we've got that protective layer on the surface. We increase and maintain the soil biology with the <coughs> soil profile uh, because soil biology likes to have a drink 
<laughs> just like the plant likes to have a drink. Soil biology is not going to exist in a dry soil. It has to have water in order to function and grow. So we got to have that water in order for that biology to work. Uh, so we de we got to decrease the uh, soil water evaporation rate from the surface, and we increase the water infiltration rate. Because the other thing that happens with that residue on the surface is that as we see the rainfall occur, that protective layer of that residue protects that soil surface from slaking. Uh, so it maintains the infiltration rate higher and higher, uh, allows that water to move down through there, uh, and it's a longer time before it seals. And, and look at what we see in terms of runoff out of a clean tilled field versus a residue. And what we see is that in agriculture, we have taken our soils to a point that they've become more and more fragile. Our soils are actually extremely fragile today. Uh, and if you think about this, that fragile nature is often expressed in what we have in terms of rainfall events. We see erosion occurring out of fields with very small amounts of rainfall. We often see rainfall or erosion coming out of fields uh, across the central corn belt with less than an inch of rain. That's not good. But that's not an uncommon occurrence uh, out there. And so the more we maintain that residue, uh, we can maintain that infiltration rate, we can protect that soil surface, and we can keep all this water going in there. Because if the water's running off, who's benefiting from it? Not you. You didn't get to even add it into your water checkbook. Okay? That's <laughs> proof. You're sending it downstream to somebody else. Uh, and so that's why I want you to start thinking about this overall thing as to what are you capturing into your checkbook as compared to what are you giving to somebody else. And so if we think about this, this no-till uh, system out there, is that virtually all the benefits of no-till come from this continuous protected blanket of crop residue. Uh, it's not from the lack of soil disturbance by tillage. Everybody thinks, well, if we just don't disturb that soil, then everything's good. But the reality is that protective layer of that residue that's, that's causing us our benefit. Uh, the no-till is really not just strictly about not disturbing the soil, it's about maintaining that protective layer. Because the other piece of this puzzle, and I, you know, in terms of the evaporation rates going back and forth, the other thing that, that occurs in this overall system and one of the things we discovered in, in a study in, in West Texas, and we, we confirmed it with some of the studies we've done in Iowa, is it only takes a 30 second of an inch of crust to stop the evaporation rate, but more importantly, to stop the gas exchange rate. The exchange of CO2 and oxygen between the soil and atmosphere is stopped by a 30 second of an inch of crust up. And so, what you really want in an actively growing crop is what? Lots of oxygen. And, uh, I always tell producers that just because corn turns green after you till it, doesn't, or cultivate it, doesn't mean that it likes cultivation. What it means is that you replenish the oxygen supply of that root system. Uh, and you see this over and over again in a lot of different cases that are out there. And what it is is really we have a lot of limitations. We have a C because what, we build up CO2 because of all the biology that's going on, and we don't replenish that oxygen from going to plant roots begin to separate. So we end up with an unhealthy crop. And if you look at the air aeration exchange in a no-till system, it's tremendous coming back. And what we've discovered in, in all of this because of the very active biological system that's going on is that we're basically feeding that crop CO2 from the soil into the atmosphere. And that CO2 gets taken up by that growing crop. And, and what you often see, and I'll give you an example of this, is that in a corn canopy, 
in the middle of the night and by early morning, we can have CO2 concentrations that exceed a thousand parts per million. And because it's, it's respired back out of that soil, put into the atmosphere, but it's captured within that corn canopy, and that's that still nature because it just did an exchange with the surface. And as soon as the sun comes up, <coughs> that CO2 is taken up very, very quickly by the crop. We've estimated that, that really some of our very actively growing systems are very high yielding systems is that corn canopy may be getting as much as 30 to 40 percent of the CO2 that's put into the grain from the soil. And so in a no-till system where we're very active, you're actually helping feed the whole CO2 into that in terms of growth as well. So there's not a water component, there's a CO2 component in terms of growth uh, aspect. If we think about this improving the soil uh, in the long term, is that we're not going to change precipitation availability. Unless somebody has really discovered something in the last two or three days. <laughs> so, you're in the, yeah. you, you didn't dial that up when you wanted it. <laughs> you know, you don't dial up wet periods and you don't dial up dry periods, you just take what you get, right? You know, so we're not going to change precipitation availability and what we got to do is change how we manage that precipitation as part of the process. And so if we think about that, <coughs> another key out there is that we're able to change the soil water availability. If we take the E out of ET, uh, we can reduce the VAP, and again, 50 to 100 percent, in some cases we've seen as much as 100 percent reduction in the E component, but we got to increase the soil biology to make this system work out there because that's our long-term benefit. Is improving the organic matter content, improving that capability of that soil to begin to store water and hold it, because that's where our advantage is. Because precipitation is going to become more variable. Now, I realize that you farm in an area that has extreme variability in precipitation anyway. But what I'm telling you is even across this region, it's going to become more variable. But that, that's just kind of the weather pattern that we're in, is this extreme variability from, from one year to the next, and within parts of the growing season to the next and everything else. So if we think about this, uh, and you think about that residue layer that's out there, we can have two things. Uh, we can have a passive protective blanket, or we can have an active protective blanket. And cover crops are as effective in terms of some of these components as is that passive residue that's out there. They do the same thing and have the same principles going on. They do reduce the soil water evaporation component that's out there. Uh, they, they use water uh, in terms of growth because they're a living organism, but their water use rates are not as large as the economic crop in between. Uh, because they're, they're smaller, uh, they're growing at times of the year in which we have small amounts of uh, uh, energy going into that. We have less gradient in terms, so the water use rates are, are much different. And in fact, going back to that West Texas, Texas example of growing wheat and planting cotton into it, is one of the first things that, that people told me when I wanted to try that experiment was that A, I was nuts, uh, but uh, B, that that would take all the water away from the cotton crop. Uh, that would put that cotton crop at risk. So we actually measured the water use uh, in bare soil versus the, the growing wheat crop. And in reality, we grew that wheat crop up to the boot stage with about two inches of water uh, transpired to that crop. It doesn't take a lot to get it to the boot stage. Actually, well, that's about the same amount of water that was used in the bare soil system because West Texas farmers have this fascination of, of taking sand and, and disturbing it three or four times uh, anyway, and so, um, and they plant three times, the first two times were for practice, and the third time, yeah. so, uh, sorry if there's anybody from the West Texas, uh, uh, um, the, uh, and so what we were doing is we found that actually uh, that growing wheat stubble wasn't costing us any more water than the standard practices that were out there just because of the, the aggressive tillage that we were doing. The same thing we see across the uh, uh, Iowa uh, is that uh, we grow a lot of our cover crops with not a whole lot more water than because they got.
guys can't till. <laughs> uh, they've got a growing crop under, but they'll tend to till uh, all the time. So we've got an active and a passive thing, and, and water use of, of those in terms of the uh, pieces of the puzzle. Um, so the benefits of this, I mean, we've got the crop residue on the surface, and then we've got all of these other uh, examples of, of what's going on. And Jill talked about this in terms of you've got the exudates from the old root system, you've got all the old root system, and basically it's the lack of disturbance uh, that allows that biology to work. But soil microbes don't like to be disturbed any more than you like to be disturbed. <laughs> okay? You really like to be woken up from that nap in the afternoon, you know. And that's the way you think about that biology, is that we can <laughs> disturb it by what we do, and it has a hard time recovering. And sometimes it doesn't uh, in all of this. So we got to look at this. Give you one more example of, of, uh, of why this becomes important. This is a study that we just finished, uh, looking at uh, soybean yields, again, across uh, Kentucky, Iowa, and Nebraska. Uh, the, uh, I'll explain this, and, and that index across the bottom is out of NRCS. It's their National Crop Commodity Productivity Index. It's actually a measure of the quality of soils that's in their database already. And, and the dots along there are the average county yields uh, in all this. And so, the better the soil, the higher the average county yield. Except if you're in Nebraska. And what we did is we cherry picked that these were only the irrigated counties. If you irrigate, soils don't have near the importance that if, you, if you're running a rain fed system. Soils become very, very important to us. And we just finished another one on corn, shows the same relationship. So, what we also see, however, is that the likelihood of failure of these crops also increases in the poor soils as well. This is the average county yield probability of crop failure increases as you go into poor quality soils as well because they don't have the water available to them uh, from that standpoint. Uh, we also looked at this, uh, different counties in Iowa. What we've discovered is that most of our yield loss uh, is occurring uh, soil management. Uh, these are, when we get in these large areas, these are the really dry years. Most of the time, our yield loss is in this 20% of what we get from potential yield. It says that we have the capability of managing them by how we manage our soils. So I can do a lot in terms of increasing the upper part of the curve very dramatically. So our whole soil management aspect is really think about increasing crop residue cover and, and reducing tillage is going to decrease our soil water evaporation as well as increasing the filtration. I'll hammer that point again uh, from the benefits of that field. But the long-term impact is to increase organic matter and water cooling capacity. It's going to benefit crop production because a large amount of our yield losses are due to short-term water deficits. When we start analyzing when crops lose yield and all the way through the process, most of the time that yield loss is short-term water deficits. If it, we have a drought, there's not a whole lot we can do about it if it never rains, okay? But most of the time in those what we consider normal years or around normal years, the short-term water deficits can, we, can be, we can take care of by, again, making just a little bit more water available. Because every day, that doesn't rain, there's a higher probability it's going to rain the next day. <laughs> it's just like playing the slot machine. You know, the more you play, the higher the potential payoff. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to say that. Uh, but in reality, the more you can increase that soil water holding capacity, the better you can go from rain event to rain event without a severe loss because you're taking care of the short term water deficits as part of this process. Because you gotta, you're going to have to endure a changing climate. And you hear Gabe talk about this in one of his as well. Is that we got increasing temperatures uh, that are occurring, we're going to get warmer, and so we're going to increase the atmospheric demand. So crops are actually going to use water more quickly uh, in all of this. We've already seen that begin to occur. We have increased variability in precipitation, so a soil water source is going to become more variable during the growing season. 
the seasonality as well as the pattern within the season. So what it says the way in which we're going to have to manage that is to begin to think about how we manage that soil reservoir, soil water reservoir. So that becomes the piece of the puzzle uh, in all of this. No-till gives us a way to do that. The advantages of no-till in all these different systems uh, allow us to do that from changing the evaporation component, changing the water availability, changing the infiltration process, all of those different things. Uh, and it's a way, in, if we go back to this metric of water use efficiency, tremendous impact for us uh, in terms of water. So with that, I'll stop and leave some time for some questions. Um, I'm sure there's one or two uh, out there, so.